this evening. Uh, it's been a wonderful few days that I've had with you folks here in this lovely state of uh, Minnesota. Minnesota. <laughs> I travel a lot. Uh, and I've really enjoyed your spring. I've had a beautiful time here, and it's nice to smell things like the grass and the trees. In Florida, you know, it's like one big season, hot and hotter, you know. So I'm awfully glad to be here with you. Uh, this evening, as you just heard, things move a little differently with masking and pouring. We have a lot of steps, and we have to dry in between. So I'm going to be chatting with you while Barb goes out in the hallway and does some drying for me. This is pretty much a very simple, basic way of working. In, is this the first one or just the drawing? Okay. Here, there's just the drawing on watercolor paper. And then I mask out. If I do, honey, I'll tip over all my paint. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You can no, come and see. Oh, okay. See all my paints back here. Right. Just everything will just go. Okay. Okay. First step is the drawing. Second step is you put mask on. It's a liquid frisket that saves your white paper. And what I masked out was the background around the palm tree and the highlights on the palm tree. Are you with me so far? Yep. Yes. And then I wet the paper and poured all three pigments at the same time. A little different way of doing it, so they blend on the paper. Let it dry, added some more mask, took the mask off the background, and just tinted the background. Okay so far? Yeah. It started to do some direct painting and finish up with direct painting. Yeah, we're getting a little bit of a feedback there. And the painting that's over, let's see if we can find this big palm tree over here. It's right over here. I went in with an opaque gesso and went and painted the background. So that is what you would call a mixed media, transparent plus opaque. And this one is all totally transparent watercolor. Now you know the difference between transparent and opaque. The light goes through transparencies, hits the surface of the white paper, bounces the light back to your eye. With an opaque media, such as the background there, light goes to the surface of the opaque paint and bounces back. It's like the difference between a stained glass window and one that you can't see through. Okay? Just so our terminology is somewhat familiar for you. Thank you, Barbara. Okay, and we'll get rid of this screen here, too. Isn't it wonderful to have all this help? Oh. Okay. The way I've been teaching this week is they pour three colors. They are three primary colors, the yellow, the red, and the blue. And let's go through what those pigments are. The yellow is Hansa yellow. You familiar with Hansa yellow? It's a nice yellow. Okay. Uh, the red is red rose deep. And the blue is thalo blue. Can you hear me back there? Thalo blue. Okay. Now you know the value of a color is whether it is light or dark. It has nothing to do with how bright it is or anything else. It has to do with the value of it. And this is your light value. This is your mid value. This is your dark value. Are you with me? Okay. Yep. All right. So those are the three pigments we're going to be using. They're all made by Da Vinci out in California. 37 milliliter tubes, very reasonable. They have very similar characteristics. They're transparent staining colors. It's important to use those particular pigments, generally speaking, because you don't lift in between each step. They stain the paper. All right, I have here a drawing on watercolor paper. My folks this week have been submitted to my dictatorial ways. <laughs> <laughs> and I have told them they must do value studies. <laughs> value studies are nothing more than breaking the painting down into shades that are light, mid-tones, dark mid-tones, and dark. The reason you have to do that if you're going to pour the way I do is you must know where you're going to put your mask. You won't know where to put your mask unless you do your value study. A line drawing isn't going to cut it. So every one of these is a definite shape and a definite value. All right, so I now have masked out for this particular painting all the whites. See all those whites in there? They are all masked out. And I also did a little bit of a reverse thing here. I also masked out this very large foreground shape 
and this very large hill shape in back of the goats. And what I'm going to do, well, you're such a big group, I won't do it. Uh, maybe you can see the, the mask. Can you see that when I do that? And it's now dry. I put actually two coats on because I wanted to make sure that I covered totally. Jean, do you do that with a brush? Or yes, and I'm going to be showing you how to do that. Yeah. I, there's nothing secret about this technique, believe me. It's all, you know, right out there. Okay, you can tell when it's dry because it turns a yellowy color and you can, you know, touch your finger to it. How did you treat your paper before you bent? Okay, I like to stretch my paper. Uh, the paper I found the most forgiving is Arches 140 pound cold press. That takes the mask the best and it's not so apt to tear and all that good stuff. This particular piece of paper is Arches 140 pound rough. It will make your life a little harder because of the hills and the valleys. <coughs> it's harder to put mask on and it's harder to remove mask. So I recommend if you're going to try this technique, Arches 140 pound cold press. What I do is I wet both sides of it under the faucet just long enough to get them both thoroughly wet, drip it off, put it on my gator board, and immediately start putting the staples in it. Put the staple down. Then I let it dry, and then it's ready to take the drawing. And I do enjoy drawing, and I do a lot of drawing. I do a lot of planning. So uh, that's where we are up to this point. Now I am going to get ready to pour it. So we don't need our little value study anymore. We'll put this aside here. And Barbara has kindly agreed to do some mixing for me. This is the yellow. Here, honey, I'll let you take that. And I know you're going to ask, how much pigment do you put in? You put in as much as you need. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to do a big painting, you don't, you know, you need a lot. If you're going to do a little painting, you don't need as much. Okay, and also you have that other variable, not only of how much, but how strong. And I would recommend when you first start pouring, you start light with a very thin mixture because you don't get in so much trouble that way. <laughs> if you start pouring and you start pouring with real dark pigments, all you're going to have after you pour is a light value that you masked out, your whites, and your dark pour. You, can't, you don't have anything in between. No values in between. So, anyway, here we go. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour for you, and then I'm going to have Barbara dry it for me. And while she's drying it, I'm going to talk to you about how you put your mask on. Because that's really important. And as soon as she gets those mixed, we will. Orange is that color? Actually, it's pretty bad. Okay. Everybody thinks they can dip their paper in there, you know. Not too good. Not too good. If I put this on here, okay, you all can scream and holler at me, but you can't see it, you can't see it, you can't see it. Can you see it? Yes. yes. That's, a, that's amazing. It's amazing. Now, these pigments, my dears, are dark. Kind of scary business. <coughs> what would happen if I didn't wet my paper? Come on, all that little color would uneven. You get hard edges. And you're going to have enough hard edges because of the mask. Wherever pigment runs up against the mask, it's going to be hard edge. And if you forgot to wet it, there would really be a hard edge. So you wet it all down. You know, a lot of this has mask on it. Mm -hmm. It really does. So we'll just go in here and do that. Grab the Kleenex stolen out of the hotel. <laughs> <laughs> They're there for your use. There for my use. If, you know. Okay. Now, if I was smart, I'd put on those gloves, but I'm not smart. Okay. I know. I'm poisoning myself. I know that. Oh, the shells should be going. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Very carefully. I should have, you know, tarps all around me. Break out the tarps. See how low she is going to go. Oops. Her face was a oops. Oops. 
color is that, Gene? Uh, this is this, the dioxazine, dioxaz, dioxazine purple. And this one is made by Maymari Blue, I think. I, I borrowed this one. You had a good question. Me? Did you say I would have done it? Because it's not it's not a real easy technique to do. You have to do a lot of prep work. Well, you're not kidding. Yeah. And uh, but the results I cannot get any other way. When I first started pouring, I let it lay in the tub a long time and then finally poured it off. Now I realize I don't have to leave it in that long. You see that value right there? That's what you're going to get. It's not going to get any darker, no matter how long you leave it there. Hmm. Okay. Now we have to figure out which direction we want to pour this off. Keep in mind, say you pour it towards the bottom, you must realize that everything that's at the top is going to then go across the bottom, right? That's just the way it is. So I think what I'm going to do is do that. But I have lots of options. What would happen, for instance, if I lowered this area and pulled up on this area? Everything that was here would go right across the yellow, right? I want to kind of hold on to that yellow. So I think what I'm going to do Lift the top, pour towards the bottom. Well, I sure got yellow. I got them yellow goats. If you feel that any time your pigment got too solid, you can hit it with a spray bottle. You can add more pigment as long as the shine is still on there. Let me spray for it. I've got this set right. And you can get actually right back to your white paper if you should care to. Let's add some more pigment in here. Should we add some more pigment? Yes. You do notice it's on an angle, so you can just pour right on and right off again. You don't like red golds? I'm having a hard time convincing my class that trees don't have to be green. <laughs> They're having an awful time with that. 